So welcome everybody to this session about Adobe and uh, FileMaker integrations. Uh, we'll start by presenting ourselves. Uh, it's uh, Andres and me, and also Cesar, who is, who is not here today at the session, but we've all been collaborating on this together. So I, I got the question before the session started. So just to give a little bit of background, how come a person born in Sweden, currently living in Germany, and some guys in Spain are working together on this project. So we met at all these uh, wonderful uh, unconference and conferences, uh, .fmp a few times over the years. Uh, and then uh, I, I was a speaker at the conference in Spain a few years ago as well. So and then after that, we kind of kept in touch. And then uh, I had a need for a client of mine uh, where we started doing a, a project. So. Andres and me, we are kind of typical old school FileMaker developers. We're solving actual problems in our working lives at the time. Found FileMaker and became developers. Whereas uh, Cesar is really a good complement to the two of us because his background is in, is in graphic design. And he then moved on to doing uh, web development. And from that point of view, he's sort of come into the FileMaker world. Which is, so he also has that. So he's like he's the one who actually uses Adobe products all the time, he, like Photoshop, Illustrator. So he can really give a lot of feedback about like the reality of the use cases, which maybe we I mean we dabble in them a little bit, but we're not specialist Adobe product users ourselves. Uh, did I forget anything, Andres? No. I think that's all. Yeah, that's all. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, off to that. Yep. Yeah, so basically we'll have three parts. Um, the first is what I already mentioned, the, the, the custom development we did for a client of mine, which is the Metro Vancouver Multimedia Division in, in Canada. Then I will move on to uh, go into more, uh, more specific details about uh, one of the two underlying uh, technologies that we are using doing these Adobe integrations. Uh, which is the common extensibility platform, CEP, which is what we use for Metro Vancouver Multimedia Division when we did the Premiere integration for them. And that is the old slash current technology. And then we'll switch and uh, Andres will uh, show us, give us, go into some more technical details about the difference between the two. And uh, then he'll go into showing uh, the unified extensibility platform, which is the current slash future technology that Adobe is providing, and show us uh, a demo of what, what we've been working on for uh, Adobe Show Photoshop. And of course, this underlying technology works for, base, well, we'll go into the details later, but basically all the, all the main uh, Adobe uh, products are supported by one of these technologies. So uh, the customer story. Uh, so here I, I'm going to say, uh, I'm, for this audience, I don't really have to tell you how great FileMaker is, but I will still insist on some points of why it is so great. Uh, and then after that, it'll be like, as I said, more and more technical as, as we move, move along. So the client is uh, Metro Vancouver. So as it says here, if you have good eyes, despite our advanced age, uh, it's basically Vancouver, BC, where I used to live and live and start my company. Uh, and all the surrounding cities, they have this collaboration and um, they do a lots, of, lots of informational material uh, and other services. So uh, that is then done via, well, the public distribution of this is among other things via the, the media room on their website uh, where they then have, yeah, yes, no, I spoke. And then they have, uh, we come to the part where, where, uh, where FileMaker comes into the picture, which is the video gallery. So uh, all these videos are then uh, produced, uh, the entire workflow to produce these videos, prepare the, the things they want to work on, etc. It's, it's all managed in FileMaker, of course. Uh, so I've been working for this client for a uh, a few years and so we've gone through a lot of changes or the client has, the solution has, uh, my interaction with them, everything has gone on through a lot of changes. Uh, there's a lot of text here, you don't have to read it all. I'm not going to read it out loud to you either. Uh, but basically it used to be this small kind of odd cable TV channel thing on its own kind of isolated away from anything but financed by Metro Vancouver. 
and over the times they moved into being uh, integrated in the main offices of, of Metro Vancouver, which are like a couple of, I don't know, 15-story buildings uh, in, in Burnaby, outside, outside Vancouver. And of course, the whole video business has evolved during these years. As we'll see shortly, it used to be all analog uh, tape, physical things, and then I think we all know how video and this distribution, everything has evolved over the East last uh, several years. I started working for them in, in, in 2009. So that's really how Finlink has been able to keep up with this, evolve, and always solve the problem. So this is uh, where I, this is not my layout. I did not design it, first of all. <laughs> uh, but it's actually, for the time, it's not a bad thing. So this is the first thing I did when I took over for them was that uh, they were on Finlink 5 or 6 or something like that. The old developer or, uh, had retired or was retiring. They needed to move to FileMaker 10 or whatever it was at the time. So I took the old files I did, like uh, merged them into a two-file solution, UI data separation. So that's basically the old solution, but running FileMaker 10. Uh, and you see, the, I mean, the typical very square layouts we used to have because that's the way monitors were. I don't know actually how old the first version was, uh, but. Uh, this is definitely uh, no, yeah, not, not the proportions we have on there. So, so here you can tell like what the actual video is. You can tell how, how physical the video world was at the time. This is inventory, tapes, CD, gear. Those are all kind of things that they were tracking in the system. Uh, and these were then the stories slash projects, they called them at the time. Terminology has been going a bit back and forth over the years. So that's basically where they were, that's the end result of all the video when they actually edit it and publish it. That's what, what you get. And then uh, we have the actual, oops, actual uh, little family of the, of the video, which was already not bad at the time, right? Um, and then this one seems to be moving on its own, so. <laughs> it's, it's a very dynamic presentation. Um, so uh, this is kind of like a, a later, later iteration. Uh, I implemented this, the design. I didn't create it myself. Uh, so basically, updated the design each time we added major features for other reasons. I kind of tried to like update or I think this one they asked to update it. They realized that the old one was, I kept telling them then Finally, they agreed, and, and we did this this relooking. Uh, and I'll I'll get into shortly. I'll get into what the uh, uh, feature changes were apart from from uh, uh, from the actual changes. So here we have, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, we have like the screenshot now. Like we have a, like a different kind of thumbnail, a little bit bigger. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I should have done it with the presentation with the file maker file the way I normally do it. Then I would have had total control. <laughs> so, uh, and then of course this is is the current iteration more or less, uh, where we have integrated with a bunch of new stuff. We have a calendar. Uh, we have uh, integrations with Vimeo for the actual final product, and then we still have uh, the possibility also to play video inside uh, FileMaker, which of course in FileMaker 5 and 10 was not so easy. And then these are like the, the single it items. Yeah, who knows? Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll be tough. And, I want to uh, promise that I'll keep you 20 minutes if I have to do it all over each time. So, uh, so. So we've done these Adobe in integrations, well, or the video editing software integrations, rather, uh, from the beginning, because uh, in the beginning they used Final Cut Pro, and then they uh, have gradually moved o over to Adobe Premiere, and like together with that, uh, moving from Mac to cross-platform to Windows only, more or less. Uh, so the first integrations were, well, integrations is not really the world word for it, but we did like, you can know, import folder, in the, which is gone now in FileMaker Pro. You, you used to be able to do that, and then you would get all the thumbnails of the videos if you had QuickTime files. So that's, that's how we got the thumbnails at the time. Uh, and then Final Cut Pro had this uh, CSV export that they then could get some information that they had input while editing. They took notes on what they were editing, what, what is this, this uh, piece of uh, film about, etc. 
what's going on. Uh, they could import that in, into the Foundry database to keep a record of it centralized and then be able to search on it. Uh, then we moved on to use because Final Cut Pro uh, allows for XML import. So that's, this I think was already there when I, I came along, more or less. This is what I did, the first uh, iteration of a proper, more proper integration, but still being one way, was the XML import. You export Final Cut Pro, file export to XML, and then you import that uh, into, into FileMaker, and then you got the data in a better way than with the CSV, you got a bit more detail. Then, uh, as they were moving to Adobe Premiere, they themselves were using the Final Cut Pro XML because you can import that to uh, Premiere as well. So that's how they were transitioning their projects in a way. So then um, I built um, a really wonderful integration in its way, which was then two-way, where we could not only import uh, XML from Final Cut Pro, uh, but more importantly, we could from import from Premiere, uh, the FileMaker database produced XML in the Final Cut Pro format, which uh, we could then import into Premiere, meaning that they didn't have to manually create start their projects. They could have a starting point with all the video they wanted to edit together, and all, they could also edit this metadata, these notes about the video. They could edit that already in the FileMaker database, so they could push that to the Premiere so they have that available in the interface. And then for reasons I'll come into shortly, um, that technology um, reached the capacity and it was not really compatible with m modern times anymore. So then uh, I got in touch with Andres and the others at uh, Tanit Data Solutions and we together we built this Adobe Premiere CEP extension, which is then communicating via the Cloud FileMaker Data API to do all, everything in a much more smooth uh, way. But first, I'll, I'll just show a couple of details on XML since I love XML. Uh, so just to tell you how much of a pain it was, basically, of course, you could do this properly with an XSLT, whatever. Long story short, there was no documentation, reverse engineering. I, I had this horrible, this big and impressive uh, template of XML where I would just substitute the details. And then the thing that really killed this over time was that not all cameras are equal. And uh, in the beginning, they had maybe a handful of cameras that were basically all the same, but then the number of audio tracks, number of video tracks, uh, different types of specific attributes of the videos. They started having iPhones on drones, 360 footage. All of that was just not possible to handle. So like when they got a new camera, if they were lucky, they could kind of duplicate uh, an XML template and reuse it for a new type of camera. Mostly I had to come in. And then to make things more fun, um, Final Cut Pro wasn't really around anymore, but they did have it. But Final Cut Pro had updated to a newer XML format than that one, which you can import into Premiere. So I couldn't even get like a, a, a sample of what it should look like. So I told them, okay, this is not going to work, and then time passed. And then eventually we moved on to doing this, this, uh, this uh, proper integration that uh, we're very happy with. So I'll just show a quick uh, video of uh, what, uh, what the workflow is now. Once they've imported all the video into the database and everything, and everything is uh, prepared, um, this is basically what, what they do. They, they open the database. We still call it inventory because we're kind of nostalgic and we like to keep our users com comfortable, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very strange term. And then they, they just, uh, yeah, they find the record. And here, of course, they can play the video if they want. They have a log mode where you can take notes more comfortably where we're not showing there. And they just enter whatever uh, details they think the editors will need in, in Premiere. And then we'll wait as, as, as they type. <laughs> So as you can see, we have lots of metadata, lots of like extra information uh, that's being uh, stored as well. And uh, now we will uh, shortly go back to the inventory record, and they will select that this one is active now on the active list for what we can import in, into Premiere. So at this point, uh, we'll switch to Premiere. And then we'll open the window extensions window, open this custom extension we built for them. 
find the list of active ones, pick the one we want, and then I mean, these are they have like pentabytes and pentabytes and pentabytes of video on huge rates. It's that's a whole whole different story. Uh, but eventually it does get imported and then it gets imported like in, the, in this structure which is the structure that ma matches their workflow and uh, we can see that we, we, can, uh, we can see the uh, metadata as well that was entered in Powermaker. Uh, so that is uh, basically uh, their workflow. So now I will um, just quickly, so as I mentioned, being able to handle any kind of video format that comes along, that was really the main reason to do this. It is easier to use as well, uh, <coughs> and there are other advantages, and, and the big thing is we can do whatever we want, basically. We have two-way communication. Whatever they are going to ask me to do, I can do it. I have FileMaker scripts, I have the data API, I have the, the CEP actions. We can do whatever we want. So uh, just to, since we were really happy, all of us, with, with how this went, the client was really happy as well, we decided to put out together a uh, keep working with these Adobe integrations. So the first thing we did was put together a sample solution, which is kind of based on what Metro Vancouver is using, but, but, but simplified, just so people can download uh, and tr try it out and see if they like it. So if you go, we have a web page, uh, cameltime.com, where you can go and download, the, there's a FileMaker file and there's the Adobe extension. You can install it. If you have the software, you, you need to run it, go ahead, play with it. Uh, and if you like it, uh, do your own ex uh, own extensions or contact us or it's up to you. Uh, so now we come to the point we've all been waiting for. <laughs> we'll have the demo and, and we'll finally see some code. So uh, now we will switch over to start starting in uh, FileMaker, of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. This is going to be very embarrassing, but I have um, I have a way around that. That happens when you try to impersonate <laughs> yes, but we we all learned that we always need to work with personas. That's why I picked Ingmar Berman for the nerds in, in the audience. <laughs> uh, so this is basically when, when you open the, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so this is, yeah. So basically, you open, you open the solution. You see all the all the uh, videos we've been working. Ingmar has been working on before. So uh, as uh, as you can see, Ingmar is really into dogs. So uh, he's preparing all the, this new movie on. Well, my life as a dog has already been made, but he doesn't know it. So uh, he already has a lot of footage, but we're, we're, since we've been uh, here in Malmö, now we're going to, to import uh, some more f footage that we recently shot. So we'll uh, import these videos, and we'll, we can organize them in collections. We can also choose to do that later or not at all. Uh, okay, we have four videos to import. We'll import these, and as, uh, as first they get important references, then we get the metadata, which is really like for the actual video editing. All this is extremely important. I'm not going to show why, etc., but it's very important for our proper metadata. And then we're getting the thumbnails just so we can get a look, good look at, at them. And then, of course, this is basically the same thing. So you're grabbing the metadata from the video file. Yeah, so there are two levels of metadata. There's like the file metadata. Uh, it's a uh, media info CLI integration that's included. So yeah, it's from the video file. And then it's FFmpeg that cr uh, generates the thumbnails. And I do other things with FFmpeg as well to yeah, convert video, etc., for Metro Vancouver, but in this file. So, so uh, we can uh, enter that. And then, of course, we go over to um, uh, Premiere, which will start up somewhat slowly, uh, but it it will come up e eventually, and then we'll see if uh, we can import uh, this into the file. So, if you look at the file metadata now, now in this case we get it. It's like a huge bunch of JSON with in these. Like these are of course my samples are just iPhone footage, so they, it's not very variable. It's the same kind of metadata all the time. But depending on the camera you have, you'll get very different results, and you get time codes, which are really important when you're editing 
different uh, video taken at different times, different uh, video files, etc. So uh, we'll open our project and then we will very much like what we already saw. We'll open this to import. We'll get the data. We can see we want something from Malmö. So this one is the one we want to add and we import it. And there it is. The video files are there. We can see them. Um, I don't know which one I input metadata into, but I think since you'll trust me that the metadata is there. So that's basically uh, the part I wanted to show. I will briefly show you as well what the actual extension looks like when you program it. Because of course, you can kind of, if you're very FileMaker, you can think of this extension window as a web viewer that kind of helps explain how it works. So it's like, uh, there are some basic uh, files and folders you need to have. There's an index.html, which I think is self-explanatory. Uh, and there's an index.js where you have like the sort of user-facing uh, JavaScript. And then you have th this one, which kind of binds the whole thing together and sets the parameters. It's a manifest file. Most of you will be familiar with that. And then this is the tricky part, which uh, Andres will explain later. This is the JSX. This is where the special stuff that talks to uh, Adobe Premiere happens, which is um, once you get it to work, it's wonderful. But uh, it, it does take a little bit of work to get used to it and, and to make things work properly. So I think at that this point, I'll, if there are any questions, you're welcome to add, like specifically to this, you're welcome to ask them quickly while we switch over to Andres. Okay, is it working? Can you guys hear me? Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, after David's presentation, part of the presentation, this part. It's going to be a little bit more about um, uh, what was next after we delivered the plugin to, to the final customer. Um, the plugin is currently in production. Uh, it's working very well. Uh, end users are, are very happy with it. They are uh, saving a lot of time. So we decided that, uh, sorry about this, I forgot to put the timer. Okay, here we are. So after delivering the plugin, the, the customer feedback was really good. So, so that was a customized plugin uh, that was uh, uh, delivered uh, for a very specific situation and uh, was connecting uh, FileMaker to Adobe Premiere users without, as you saw, having to have FileMaker installed so that uh, reduced the friction a lot. So that was a really good uh, way to solve the problem. And uh, so we said, okay, what's next? Uh, this has been a really good experience. Uh, we have some knowledge about uh, Adobe. Uh, how they work, how, how you, you can interact with it, how you can connect with it with the, with the data API. So we thought, okay, let's, um, uh, let's take this knowledge, let's uh, leverage it, and uh, let's do some experimentation, and let's create a plugin for Photoshop that uh, where we can test uh, the bi-directional communication between Photoshop and, and, uh, and, and FileMaker. 
So this part of the presentation is going to be about our experience. We want to share this learning process. Uh, as David says, and show the files, they are basically uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. So for those of you who are doing custom web publishing, this is a little bit of a step uh, further because you need to uh, go through the uh, Adobe documentation and, uh, and find out about the specific uh, syntax that uh, needs to be used to communicate with Adobe products. So yeah, I will speak about also the difference between extended script and USP in a minute. I will continue with a demo. And finally, we will, uh, we will see some code about uh, what is behind the, the plugin uh, we developed for Photoshop. Okay, so extended script. Uh, what is extended script? What is, what is UXP? Why is this important? Uh, when we started having a look at the documentation for Photoshop, something that we noticed is that uh, they had just implemented a new way of developing plugins uh, for Photoshop. So extended script was going to be deprecated at some point. It's not going to happen any, anytime soon, but it's going to happen. So I'm going to speak about the pros and cons of both extended script um, and the uh, UXP. So the main advantages of extended script it is, is it is widely used, right? I mean, it's been there for many years. There are plenty of uh, resources, uh, maybe if you are new, like we were, we were new to extend the script, so maybe you get stuck. Uh, you go to Google, you know, uh, you make a search, and maybe somebody else went through the same problem. Maybe you, you find something in Stack Overflow, maybe, maybe it points you to some official documentation, some blog post. So that definitely makes the development process uh, much easier. Uh, something important is that it's available for most of the Adobe applications, uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, Premiere, InDesign, so all of them, they work well with extended script, has been used for many years, so it's a proven technology, so that's another advantage. Uh, some drawbacks, the first one I would say it's a very inefficient development environment. Uh, also, deployment and distribution requires some extra steps. But, uh, you know, I mean, working with a standard script, sometimes you need to restart the plugin to, to see the changes reflected on the panel. Uh, sometimes you need to restart for the, um, Premiere. Sometimes you even need to restart the whole operating system because especially if you make changes to the manifest XML, XML file because it's, it's, it's in the library in an extension folder. So that's uh, definitely a drawback. Another one is that extended script is an obsolete uh, programming language. It's a dialect of ES3. So that means that you cannot really use functions like, uh, you, you cannot really use like JSON stringify, JSON parse. That makes the code ugly. You need to um, get libraries, uh, use workarounds. Finally works, but it's not very nice experience. Also, it's going to be deprecated, so that's another main reason to go for UXP. So UXP, the, the advantages is that uh, it's very much similar to a web development experience. So for those of you who deal with FileMaker Custom Web Publishing, that's just another step forward. Uh, it's about studying, the, for instance, in this case, the Photoshop API documentation. Uh, UXP, okay, something about extended script is that uh, in order to deal with, with Premiere and in the other case, JavaScript communicates with, the, with extended script. Extended script, they communicate synchronously, so they send back the result. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable way to work. Uh, but UXP, everything is in the same code. I mean, you can use modern JavaScript, uh, you can use modern frameworks, you can use React. You call the API. Uh, well, it's, uh, JavaScript is asynchronous, so, but you, 
if, when you call the Photoshop API, you need to, <coughs> to maybe do some awaiting or, but, but still it's, everything is in the same code. So, so that makes things so much easier. It's going to replace a standard script, as I said before, so it's, um, it's also necessary to, to jump uh, there as soon as, as soon as you can. Uh, some drawbacks, it was, uh, it was released last year, so uh, in some cases uh, you are on your own. I mean, if you have an issue, if you are doing the programming, if something doesn't work, uh, maybe you will get lucky, maybe you will find some answer, but uh, it was just released last year for the general public, so that's a drawback. It's only available so far for Photoshop and XD. And the good news is that last month they just released the EN Design uh, UXP technology. So, I mean, but the scripting part only, I mean, not the plugin panels. But this is good news because it means that Adobe is moving forward really quick with this technology. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, let's take a look at the UXP developer tool. This is something, this is a game changer. Uh, if you are doing development with, um, I mean, compared to, compared to um, extended script, uh, there, there was some tool in extended script and some uh, VS extension, but it didn't really work out very well for the bugging. It was a nightmare. I mean, sometimes, I don't know, it wasn't very nice. But this is very similar to what you would see, um, <coughs> that what you would see when you activate the, um, when you activate the, uh, the, developer, the developer tools, like in a web browser, like in Chrome or Safari or, or the one you choose. So, but before that, um, this covers, the UXP tool covers the whole cycle. You know, I mean, you can choose here, you can remove the plugin. We're not gonna do that just in case, no, you know, we shouldn't do that uh, now. Uh, you, can create, you can create a plugin. This creates the manifest JSON file, like the XML file that David was talking before. Uh, but this is equivalent in JSON. You can add a plugin that maybe you download from a repository. And uh, here you can load the plugin. Okay, it's not working because we need to have Photoshop open. Uh, I mean, because here you see on the left side that is saying what are the connected applications. If this plugin was for XT, we would open XT, and uh, now we can load the plugin. So this is it. This is what uh, we have worked on. This is a sample plugin. We wanted to test the connection from any server, any kind of file. So I'll show, I'll show you a little bit later about that. Uh, so uh, something about the UXP developer tool. You can watch the code. So if you are working with vanilla JavaScript, uh, CSS, and HTML, as soon as you save the file, it's going to reflect the, the changes here. This is really useful. Um, so, so yeah, this, this is really important also. Um, this, is, this is the game changer. You have the, 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 the console where, where you can, this is so similar to, to like uh, standard developer tools in any web browser when you went to the back. You have the console, you have the services, the network. So, so this works out really well for, for the development process. It makes it so much easier. Uh, okay, let's carry on with it. Okay, so the demo plugin, uh, as I said, we wanted to, to test the bidirectional communication. So we developed a sample plugin that basically what it does is downloading a, an image from, from, uh, from FileMaker into Photoshop using a, a plugin panel, uh, similar to what David shown that was a CP panel, that's the terminology for extended script, and then uploading from Photoshop to FileMaker without the users having to have FileMaker installed and you know reducing the friction, so they, they have it right there inside the application that they used uh, every day. So we, to be honest, we wouldn't be using this for like a real, uh, like a real situation, especially dealing with files with FileMaker. 
FileMaker is, let's say, is not the most efficient tool for dealing with files. Uh, there are some other, I mean, depending on the kind of files, obviously, and, and the use case. But when it comes to big files, uh, there come with some, uh, some other options. In the case of uh, Metro Vancouver, they are having their own file server. Some other clients, maybe they, they use like uh, AWS S3, some other, they might use FTP. So in those cases, uh, the good news is that FileMaker is really good at displaying data. So we can use a web viewer with some basic uh, CSS and, and HTML or, you know, there, there are many options. Some possible uses, uh, you know, connected in Adobe uses to FileMaker solutions, logic, if you have a customer solution, you can share, uh, you can implement uh, automatization with Photoshop or FileMaker a scripting engine, that's uh, another option. Okay, so let's finally take a look at the Photoshop FileMaker connector. Um, okay, what am I here? So I'm going to connect to some demo server that we have uh, set up for this presentation. It's a... Uh, Good, we're connected. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are John the Designer. John the Designer is going to log in into edit. Ooh, this is not good. Oh, okay. And the password was easy, so I mean, okay. So this is the, 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 this user, it's uh, authorized for this database. So this database uh, has this layout where, where the user can access it. So let's just make a find request. Like this is like a standard file maker finding. So, so we are inside Photoshop. I mean, uh, in case it looks a little bit confusing, but this is a panel inside Photoshop. And uh, this designer has some task, and the task is to create a black and white version of this zebra. So we are going to download the pic. Oh, you know what? I'm going to open FileMaker Pro so we can see the, the database. OK. Again, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> it's not five, I swear it's not five. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have the database here with uh, these three records. These are the same that are being displayed in this uh, plugin panel. So we are going to download the Zebra. Uh, it gives the option to, to save the file. And here we have it. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to put the, yeah, here is better, okay. Okay, so, um, Adobe users are, uh, they use a lot of actions, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but it's a way to, it's similar to macros, right? So you can record something, and so I just, I don't know anything about Photoshop, to be honest. We have another person in the, in the team is good with that. So we are going to make it black and white. Uh, we click on it, uh, we save it. And then, uh, OK, FileMaker, where are you? Oh, here we are. OK. So now we are going to upload it. And uh, hopefully, it will appear in FileMaker. After we save it, yeah, replace it. Okay, there we are. Finally, it worked. <laughs> and uh, let's do the same with the hippopotamus. Uh, yeah, no, we are going to do the inverted, which is uh, where are the actions? Here they are. Yeah. Oh, did I do the, the invert before? Okay, I did the invert here. Okay, so let's do something fancy here. I, just, I don't know what it is. Some saturation, yeah. Okay. 
So we go we go back and let's upload it right here. Why not? Um, okay, there we are. So um, something is interesting about this plugin. The way we wanted to do the testing is that uh, it works with. Uh, with uh, any pretty much any FileMaker database that uh, that uh, can be created. So I'm showing this in case. I mean, I guess we are all familiar with FileMaker, but but uh, engage, okay. But uh, let's just create. Uh, some text, okay. Oh yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we wanted to save. Okay, I'm gonna set the password here so we are able to upload it. Uh, okay, it's not gonna be one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Almost. Almost. Genius. Okay. And something interesting uh, is necessary. We are going to set up a password for for John. Okay, and the the, the important thing here is uh, the privilege set uh, to data entry only. But it's important. Well, important. We need to. We need to to enable the, the data API extended privilege access. So. Okay, so now we are going to upload it. Okay, close it. I don't need to enter the password there. That makes easier. Okay. So, so here we have the file. Uh, let's say that, uh, oh, no, I'm just gonna make a screenshot of this. And hopefully I will drag it there. Hello. Another, yeah. So now if we go to the, to the plugin, uh, let me just, yeah, let me just connect again. So now we have the new database available. Uh, we have the default layout and we have the text field where we can, you know, make a fine request. So we hide there, we have the picture. We can download it. Oh. What happened? You upload. Oh, I did upload. Yes. Okay, I did upload. You know what? Yeah, that was actually expected. No, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. were testing us. Uh, yeah, I was testing if. Yeah. So let me just do this. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, good point. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. There we are. So now we can download it. Here we are. And uh, yeah, same thing. We can like uh, do some changes, and we are just going to override the original one. So there we are, and uh, so that's basically what the plugin does. It's uh, again, it's to test performance, to test uh, communication with the, uh, between FileMaker and Photoshop. And uh, I'm gonna go really quickly over the um, the code, uh, why React. Uh, well, it's also part of our internal training, uh, our way to experiment. So we are still React babies, only a few months old. But we are really pleased with the uh, with the experience. So 
Uh, just to summarize, it's used by Adobe engineers and its components base. It makes it uh, modular, scalable. And the uh, oh, Clarice Studio is using React, apparently. That's as far as I know. So about the plugin code, OK. Let's have a look at the plugin code. Uh, come on. Yeah, there you are. So this is uh, David show, uh, shown, has shown the manifest.xml file. This is something very similar. It contains the metadata about the, the plugin, also some permissions, uh, entry points. So that's important. The FileMaker connector, JSX, oh, nothing to do dot JSX from React with dot JSX from extended script. That's something to take into account. Uh, JSX is a component in React. So here we can see this is what we, this would be the equivalent to AppJS in React, but uh, the good thing about the UXP is that you can have multiple panels. So you could, you could have like more than one. So this is like the backbone of the React application. As you can see, there is a separate connection. This is the, the, the fields for entering using credentials. This is what, what it is called in, in React uh, a hook, uh, FileMaker uh, uh, use context hook. We could use also props, but uh, just for convenience, uh, we decided to, to have all these uh, pieces of data available to all the children hook, uh, children components that are uh, on the FileMaker connector. So to see an example about the server connection, um, I know this can look a little bit confusing, and uh, but, uh, but the bottom line is basically, this is like a script trigger, use effect hook, uh, whenever it changes the, file, the FMS address, which is the, the, what the user inputs, it's going to try to connect to the FileMaker server and just to check if the if the URL is valid is valid, and and that server has a data API uh, enabled. So if everything will go, uh, this is uh, this is JS. Uh, this is um, um, this is what the, uh, the 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 browser the browser no sorry the plugin is going to render. So we can see here. Specific labels that they are the, that the Adobe provides out of the box. That's what it makes uh, the the plugin looks uh, the panel looks consistent. Uh, you could you could use a standard HTML tags, but uh, this is just making it uh, very convenient. And uh, also there is uh, as you can see there is an error handler component. So this basically. I mean, just to have a look at what a component is in, in, in React. Uh, this code could be reduced, but uh, just for showing purposes, um, uh, we are making it a little bit more readable. So if there is a, the, so this, this component is taking two props the, to, to check if there is an error and a message. If there is no error, the message is going to be a success message. If there is an error, it's going to be an error message. If it isn't defined, it's not going to do anything. Uh, so it's going to return an empty fragment. And uh, if there is an error, it's going to apply this uh, CSS class that is just a regular CSS class. Actually, it's, on, it's basically painting it to, to be red. And uh, it's going to show this icon. An icon, this is also that comes out of the box with the UXP technology. And uh, if it is a success, that means that there is no error. If there is a message, if there is no message, it's going to return an uh, empty fragment. Otherwise, it's going to display the, the success message. So, so this is what happens. Uh, if I can find the, oh, there it is. So this is basically it, it, the, the error. Uh, so this is the error message, and this is the success message. So now I'm going back to David. Uh, he's going to uh, do a little bit of a recap and, and a couple of conclusions. So let me just. Thank you, Andres. That's 
judges. I find the presentation interesting every time I watch it myself. So, <laughs> uh, so basically, just to sum up, maybe that's a couple of points. Uh, first of all, we've shown kind of uh, simple examples of what we're doing, but it is uh, the underlining concept with the technologies we have here. We can make any kind of communication between Photoshop and FileMaker. Based on information in Photoshop, we send that to FileMaker, we process things in FileMaker with all the skills we have, FileMaker scripts, anything we do, we can return a script result, we can return data, go back, do something else in Photoshop based on what happened in FileMaker, based on business rules, based on data-driven events. So it's an extremely powerful thing. You can implement <coughs> project management for designers, task tracking, completion status, uh, approvals, distributing the, the designs, you can, you can tweet the file instead of posting it to, to FileMaker, you can basically do whatever you want once you have this underlying fundamental structure in place. So that to me is what really makes this very amazing to me. The other thing is something that we've touched on many times. I think everybody here, most of us are old school FileMakers. We started like in the web, you were dabbling a little bit with certain HTML things. Uh, and then by and by, some of us pick up less JavaScript, others like Andres a bit more. But it's something like we as FileMaker developers basically all have to do. And the fact that we have done it is now starting to pay off even outside FileMaker. We can start doing things that as, as like old school FileMaker people own new FileMaker. You would never dream of doing something like this. <coughs> but because of the journey that Claris FileMaker has been going through and that we've been learning with that as well, we are now able to do all these uh, amazing things. So that's why Claris plus FileMaker plus Adobe equals that. Thank you. <laughs> Any uh, final questions? Yes? So what I just told you, you moved the picture from Panica to, to, to Adobe. Yes. But is it possible to have additional uh, information like uh, if you define in FileMaker like the, uh, the format uh, of, course. of course, of course, of course. This, this is a very crude, since UXP yeah. is a very new yeah. technology and until recently they were changing it quite a lot. So it's kind of like with Claris, you can only go so far because, so, <laughs> because they change things. But so yes, you can of course. have a business yeah. card yeah. where yeah. you have a text and things like that. So you yes, just yes, yes. Add an end yeah, exactly. That's, that, that's exactly what I was getting at. Like now we were doing this by buttons. We were yeah. turning it black and white and normally that would be already set in the file maybe database and then the image would go right up basically come down go up so you know for sure and also you, we, you can write to the metadata the uh, in like XMP metadata wherever you want to write you can also write to, so yes Klaus can, can you automate so he was talking about business cards so let's say you have an organization of 200 people you have the data in FileMaker and then you need to put them together and create a print file can you automate that without... Right now, with, with this integration design. requires a user to click a button in the extension panel. Okay. So There's no, like, we're not doing... I mean, Adobe has a lot of APIs as well where you could automate that kind of thing. This is not what we're showing today. No, 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 uh, no, no, no but... But, uh, but the, the technology but, yeah. you're tapping into, is that possible to automate? Use that for automation. You unify it. Yes, of course. Like, like, yeah, you can say like the settings instead of having, because the problem is like a lot of the Adobe settings, as you say, they are kind of each user's local computer, right? Maybe Andres, you can expand more on that. Yeah, that's something that, uh, I mean, that's, I think that there is a good potential there because I think you can save, uh, I mean, we haven't experimented with it, but uh, I'm pretty sure that it can be done, we can. Uh, the JSON manifest file has, uh, a property that uh, it is allow uh, code from strings, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we want to experiment uh, yeah. with. And there is something that's called batch play in the Photoshop API that allows you to, to execute actions like a sequence of actions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something really interesting to, to do research on mm -hmm. because that means that uh, many different Photoshop users they can have access to the same to the same standardized uh, uh, maybe protocols like saying uh, this picture we are going to publish in a website 
Uh, maybe it needs to be like this size, the resolution needs to be this, or exactly. it needs to be rotated. So this is something interesting that maybe different Photoshop users can have access to that uh, functionality, and that makes it like more standard. Yeah, and InDesign is coming. InDesign is, yeah, it's already partially here, but uh, not completely. Uh, Fabrice, uh, I think? Yeah, exactly, uh, about InDesign. Here, well, we can already do InDesign with CP. It's just that for us, it's more headache. And for you, if you have to learn, it's even more headache. Because so we have CP in, in InDesign. If, like, if it's urgent, like right now, it's kind of like if you start doing an InDesign integration, now you kind of have to decide on what risk you are willing to take and what your timeline is. That's just the reality of how technology is evolving at this point. But we have like full capacity with CP and in design, hopefully better capacity, but mm, with, not today. <laughs> yeah, by in the next year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they've been moving quickly, so yeah. Hopefully in the next few months, yeah. because they are, oh. they, are moving, they are moving quickly. But the, the thing is that, uh, I mean, as David said, it's, it's like uh, another technology. It's kind of a headache to do development with CP. Uh, so it's not really worth it to do it with something for mm. in design right now. I will not say that. <laughs> let's, agree, let's agree to disagree. <laughs> no, no, okay. But I'm talking maybe about the design. If it is but you can make the basic, uh, just uh, wait. Yeah. I would analyze very specifically the needs and then uh, come. But yes, Alberto? Uh, I may not be aware of what uh, Adobe is doing licensing-wise, but uh, the question may be stupid. Uh, is there a minimum version of Creative Cloud that must still do? Or you define in the manifest file what the minimum version okay. is, and of course, uh, with the UXP, it's basically the latest or almost the latest version. And uh, with CP, you can go really far back. Depends on exactly what features you are using, but it, it's ver it's very easy to control. Okay. But uh, if you are deploying to unknown Adobe users, that's definitely something you need to plan for and communicate very clearly. Eggbox. Since uh, Adobe is now getting more and more expensive. So this is, this is kind of exactly what I was hinting at when I say that this is the journey role on us file makers to get to know to do these technologies as well. At this point, uh, we already we still have lots to learn on, on the Adobe side of things, so we haven't specifically looked into it. But if there's a need, uh, we definitely would look at it, and, and uh, we would be, uh, of course, at some point, we would be very happy to. Uh, John? So you're, you're, you're triggering what's happening from a panel inside Product, yeah. Um, how much consideration have you given, and how technically possible is it to be triggering from FileMaker into yeah. the Adobe yeah. product? Yeah, so that's kind of yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. Here's a record. Yeah. Somebody yeah. needs yeah. a new business card. Yeah. Press this button. Yeah. Go yeah. off. Use Photoshop as yeah. the engine yeah. to do the work. Create the PDF. Send it off for approval as a connect frame. Yeah. Suddenly, you've got a whole very yeah. serious yeah. workflow yeah. Um, that's being yeah. managed, and the place it needs to be managed, you're essentially using Photoshop as image magic or something. Yeah. I mean, you can always work with robots, right? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say that probably, I mean, Adobe does, I mean, it's kind of what I, I said to Klaus as well. Adobe has a lot of APIs that we, we have not had the time to explore fully yet. We're definitely very interested in that. At this point, it, a lot of this is kind of. Like in FileMaker, there are certain things that aren't server compatible, right? Yeah. And I think these these things are probably quite dependent on running a local machine. But I that I do not know for sure. I don't know if you have a better idea. Something that we tested at the beginning, but it's obviously not ideal, was executing a script from from Adobe using the FMP URL. But uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't very. Uh, you, you don't get that. Uh, so we decided to go yeah. to the You still need the yeah. local application yeah. running. So that, no, I mean, that's the main issue, I think. Yeah, that's the yeah. main issue. You need to have file yeah. making, opening, and you can execute a script from Photoshop or Premiere in FileMaker as long as it is open with the FMP URL uh, protocol. Yes. So how about storing uh, these stores? Do you store those pictures and videos outside FileMaker or inside? 
So this is just a demo. That, that's what Andres said in the beginning. This is, this, yeah. So in, in Metro Vancouver, as I said, they have RAID drives with pentabytes and pentabytes of video file. We do not store, we will store the thumbnails in FileMaker, uh, but nothing else. And in any real life scenario, I don't think you would want to store anything other than thumbnails in FileMaker, actually. No, this is just to show like yeah. e an easy way to demo it. Yeah, something I didn't mention about the storing files in FileMaker yeah. is the data API has a limit of, I think it's like three gigabytes or two or something like that per month per user. So, you know, it can get like a licensing wise, it can be like really, really expensive. So, so I, I don't think FileMaker and the data API, I mean, it's not really the best solution for, for pictures no. and, and files. And John? Presumably, he's storing those files on S3, generate yeah. yeah. pre signed URL. Exactly. Yeah. That's where the download is coming from, not yeah. from FileMaker itself. Exactly. Just yeah. the metadata yeah. of the thumbnail. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, Metro Vancouver is we just get a file URL. Yeah. And then that's what we're working with. And of course, uh, the extension languages also have their own kind of curl feature. You don't have to do every, everything in a file maker script. You can just add more stuff that you actually do in the extension itself. Yeah. And then just the end result, when you're happy or sad, you send that to file maker. Okay. okay. If there are no Excellent. more questions, I will say thank you very much. <laughs>